Today is October the 6th, 2016. My name is Tanya Fincham and along with me is Dr. Charles Abramson. We are in the OSU Library, Oklahoma State University Library, to, to speak with Dr. Bob Grauman, a director, former director of the Scholarship and Recognition Program. Scholar Development. And Scholar recognition. Development. Get that right. Scholar Development yeah. and Recognition here. And you retired in 2014? Three years ago, exactly, yeah. With 33 years of service, I think mm -hmm. I read. Yes. So thank you for coming today. Thank you. Uh, the, this uh, talk will eventually get around to Phi Beta Kappa stories, but let's begin with learning a little bit about how you came to be at OSU, uh, beginning with when and where you were born. Okay. I was born in Enid, Oklahoma, and grew up in two small towns near Enid, Okeen and uh, Fairview. Uh, and. Uh, we spent a lot of time coming to ball games in Stillwater, and uh, my father had been a student here in 1938 as a 16-year-old freshman, and uh, wow. he plowed through the history curriculum so fast that his mentor, who was um, Dean Schiller Scroggs of the Arts and Sciences College, had him uh, transfer to the University of Minnesota to work with some historians uh, there on topics that were of interest to both of them. And then World War II broke out, and my father signed up um, to be uh, in the Navy. And after serving in the Pacific for a while, he was tested for his uh, language skills um, because there was a secret program going on to train uh, <clears throat> American military men, Army and Navy, in Japanese so that during the coming supposed invasion, um, they would be interrogators and spies and uh, uh, translators uh, before and during the, uh, the uh, invasion. So um, after having uh, been commissioned as an officer, uh, my father received his orders, it was in New York, and was surprised to see that he was being transferred back to, of all places, during the war. Stillwater, Oklahoma, 70 miles from where he grew up. Um, that was a program for 500 highly literate naval officers who were expected to become totally fluent in Japanese in one calendar year because that was when the uh, invasion was, was being planned. Uh, the program had been started in, in, uh, at the University of Boulder but it, it needed more space. So OSU and uh, Stillwater, A&M at the time, won the contract and um, all of those individuals, 500 of them, uh, returned to Stillwater where they were taught by Japanese natives who had been incarcerated uh, during the war for being Japanese. And they were sent, uh, those uh, uh, individuals were sent uh, from California and other parts of the country with their families to live in Stillwater and uh, teach uh, Japanese language and culture basically 24 hours a day to these uh, brilliant young officers in the Navy. Well then, the war ended about eight months into that time and uh, my father left as all the Navy veterans did. The Army won the contract to go occupy uh, Japan and uh, the Navy men dispersed to their various lives and um, interestingly enough there were so few individuals in the United States studying Asian languages that at least half I would say that I know of of the individuals who were in that program became academics and the, the um, family trees now in a lot of Asian studies programs in the country all go back to Boulder and Stillwater, Oklahoma, where those men learned their Japanese. That's very interesting. Very interesting, yes. yeah. yeah. And there is more information being released all the time. And uh, in fact, I've been trying to get um, the person who's responsible for the archives of that program to come back and do a program here in Stillwater because many Stillwaterites had no idea that that very unusual program took place with so many eventually highly successful individuals. Well, where did they house that many? 
Well, they know? lived, uh, I think Cordell Hall was, was available. Uh, people opened their homes. This was seen as a real plum for Stillwater because uh, they uh, it had financial benefits. So um, the whole community kind of banded together to welcome these people and eventually the community formed a, a really nice uh, uh, home for the Japanese too. As you might recall, uh, opinions of the Japanese during World War II were very, very bad. And there were um, uh, anticipated problems with bringing Japanese into this community. And um, in fact, there was a, um, uh, a big meeting uh, that was held to try to block the Japanese families from sending their children to Stillwater Public Schools. And there was a loophole that didn't allow the, uh, uh, for uh, any uh, ethnic group such as the Japanese to be sent to segregated schools. So they had to go to the public schools. And two years later, you can see pictures of Japanese in the yearbook, one of whom became the president of the senior class. So the whole thing had a very positive outcome and put the city of Stillwater in a, a, a good light and the individuals who studied here have fond memories of, of the time that they had. Well, how did your dad get selected to be part of that? Well, they were all tested. There were some 20,000 military people who were tested for their ability to uh, break codes and to acquire language. And uh, out of that group, a thousand were selected. Um, and he was one who was sent to Stillwater. And he would have been young if he, since he started so young here when he was 16. Yeah, I think he was in his early 20s mm -hmm. by that time. So. Did, did he become fluent in Japanese? Um, he was, he's a part of the World War II generation, and in fact, it wasn't until after he died that I learned quite a bit about this. Mm -hmm. You know, the greatest generation chose not to talk about their war experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, re we knew that he'd been to Stillwater, my sister and I, my mom confirmed that, but we were never really quite sure what he had done here. And I suppose, again, typical of that generation, they had been told this was top secret and not to talk about it. Ever. <laughs> and so that's what they, they followed orders. <laughs> was my impression. Was he the first in his family to go to college? Yes, he was, he was an only child too, so he was the only one. And his parents had not gone. Mm -hmm. And why OSU? Because it was close. Yeah, just down Oklahoma the road. Oklahoma A&M, I guess I should say, from that mm -hmm. time period. Yeah. Well, education was important <clears throat> to your, to his parents. I, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was an only, and then our. And then he, he um, unlike most of the individuals I described, uh, after studying for a, a master's in history uh, at the University of Wisconsin, then he decided that he could best satisfy his intellectual pursuits by following his father into the banking business. And so he returned to Western Oklahoma and became a banker in O'Keen and Fairview and uh, did a lot of public service in those towns on school boards and library boards and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, we always thought that probably he regretted to an extent not going into academe but uh, I think that he enjoyed his scholarly life in that uh, out-of-the-way environment, mm -hmm. really. My sister and I talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. So there are two of you, your mm -hmm. sister and you? Yeah. And did both of you, well, you came to OSU. Did your sister as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Take us through your career really quickly, then your educational background. Um, I, I started here in pre-law and uh, was uh, uh, involved in um, several act several activities, but primarily I enjoyed following following OSU sports and hanging out with friends. I was a typical college undergraduate, I presume, uh, and um, met my wife here, and uh, eventually kind of bore down academically and got a master's in English here, and then a PhD at the University of Tulsa, and. Uh, in 1977, I got that uh, that degree, and then I went off and taught for three years at Illinois State University in Normal, Illinois, and then um, that was a, a um, temporary job without any hope of tenure track or permanent status, and um, we decided that we 
would probably enjoy Stillwater as much as community members as we had undergraduates and, and graduate students. My wife got her master's here too in history and um, we just moved back to Stillwater and got jobs. Started out, I started out uh, working in the Dean's Office of Arts and Sciences as an assistant to Smith Holt. Um, and my wife eventually landed a job in the English Language Institute for International Students. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing led to another with uh, arts and sciences and then I became the director of university scholarships in 1988, um, which had a list of, of uh, assignments. Um, primary among them during that time was to improve OSU's reputation recruiting National Merit Scholars. We were uh, very much running a distant second place to the University of Oklahoma, and um, the regents wanted to see an improvement in that. And so for three years I had a university vehicle and went around and tried to meet every National Merit semifinalist in the state, convince them to come to OSU. It became clear that that was a kind of a losing proposition for us, and probably wasn't reflective of the land-grant mission so much. Uh, that it was a, a program that uh, maybe was uh, better suited to, to other schools, but that we needed to focus kind of on our mission. So we enacted some scholarships for valedictorians and high ACT students. And um, then uh, one day, um, one of my boyhood heroes walked into the office who was, of course, Henry Bellman, uh, and I'm sure you have a lot of information on him, but I'll just add my, my story. Um, at the bottom of my list of assignments uh, was uh, the job of, of identifying and training, recruiting, training, mentoring students who wanted to apply for major national and international awards. I didn't really think that I should spend much time to that when the other things seemed a lot more important. But Henry Bellman asked to see me and he pointed to that uh, job, part of my job, and said that he'd been on the Truman Committee for several years and he'd never interviewed an OSU student and he wanted to know why. <laughs> and uh, you know, he was such a heroic figure in Oklahoma that I was, I was uh, pretty young at that time and I was uh, very alarmed <laughs> and he gave me the name of a uh, uh, friend in Washington who was the head of the Truman Foundation. His name was Lewis Blair um, and he said, well this man can help. You need to contact him and then uh, I always remember on the way out the door he said, young man I think you need to work a little harder. <laughs> So, uh, you know, that was a, a real, uh, what would you say, a, a focusing moment. And uh, to make a long story short, Lewis Blair came to campus. He gave us some tips. And a year later, we had our first Truman. Ten out of the next 11 years, we had Trumans and became a Truman Honor College. And then we had our first Rhodes, first Marshalls, uh, first Udalls, first Mitchells. And... Uh, Eventually, over a 15-year period, we had uh, over 75 students who won those awards, primarily because of Henry Bellman and his uh, interest in his alma mater <laughs> and his encouragement. <laughs> so, uh, How had anyway. he seen your job description? Yeah, and so, as a result of that, uh, uh, Jim Halligan recognized what a stir this was causing and how OSU's reputation was changing as a result and so he proposed that we set up an office just to do that and that's when it became the uh, Office of Scholar Development and Recognition and we turned over all of our scholarship basic scholarship functions to financial aid where they belonged in the first place and um, started started working uh, with students and setting up programs. We set up a program in Cambridge. We set up some major research programs. Charles knows about our Wentz research that the Wentz, local Wentz Foundation uh, helped us with. Uh, both of those are still in operation 25 years later. And uh, 
you know, it's uh, probably the <clears throat> the thing that I'm kind of proudest of is that uh, people started giving money to the office in Henry Bowman's name, uh, and uh, we decided that we needed to recognize him, so we changed the name of the office to the Henry Bellman Office of Scholar Development and Undergraduate Research. Okay. That's what it is now. Yeah, that's good. I have done some interviews about Henry, so it's, it, it, yeah. that, that piece of the part of oh it, too. Oh, my gosh. He, I just, uh, uh, I actually found a picture. I'd been a uh, page in the legislature when I was 12, and I had completely forgotten that he was governor then, so I have a picture of him and me. I think I've got it in that backpack. I carry it around everywhere. <laughs> uh, but um, what he did and uh, what he represented in terms of his public persona mm -hmm. just really is hard to describe, especially in these times. He was very good at connecting people with he was. and changing he really career was. paths of mm -hmm. a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. So it's. Uh, and when yeah. then that kind of feeds into Phi Beta Kappa. When you first yeah. came, we didn't have, OSU didn't have Phi Beta Kappa. Well, I wouldn't have known what that was at the time. <laughs> and very few OSU people would because uh, it had never really occurred, I think, for many land grants. I would think of Clemson and uh, Texas A&M, all of whom have it now. I would imagine the same thing was true at land grants. Uh, at the time, maybe Cornell would, be, would have been different since that's a kind of a an Ivy uh, quality institution, reputate by reputation. Um, but it wasn't, uh, I don't know, Charles, maybe you can help. Uh, what time do you remember a lot of the larger public schools, including land grants, hooking on to the Phi Beta Kappa dream? Well, I'm not sure about that, but I knew about Phi Beta Kappa for a long, long time when I was a child. Yeah. You know, my mother would always push upon Phi Beta Kappa. Yeah, yeah. Was your father aware of it? I mean, when he uh, with, oh, you didn't have it, but his other never, places. We never talked about it. Other one did. Where he, where but, he got um, his masters, he didn't. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I started hearing that we were making an effort. Obviously, by then I knew uh, <clears throat> what it involved, and uh, I actually just learned about a couple of efforts, but was not a part of the first two. I don't have the dates, but I know there were two early in my stay at OSU. And uh, then uh, later on, when uh, Dr. Gethner took over and we got a little more serious about this, mm -hmm. then uh, we were able to tie the Honors College and the Scholar Development Office together to become a crucial part of the application, I think. And Bob Spurrier really deserves a lot of credit for that. He, I don't know, if are you gonna interview him? Already done. Already done? Good. I'm sure he gave you a lot of information that I wouldn't have been familiar with. Um, but um, then uh, it was, uh, I guess, shortly after. I know that there were a couple of times that I heard certain aspects of our university could use improvement, such as foreign language, uh, and uh, or at least some focus, uh, along with the uh, focus on scholars. And um, so it was about that time that we decided to push that a little bit harder. Mm. And, and then when Burns arrived, it was such a, a gratifying thing to learn that he um, wanted to make that a priority. Um, and uh, Well, you so, predicted it in the interview when you, with Dr. Gill, he asked you something about yeah something else and you said we're going to get it mm -hmm. and yeah. oh no so you were yeah you were <laughs> gun ho at that right point. yeah we were we were excited that we had some momentum and people like charles and perry and other other individuals on campus uh, were fully supportive and uh, land grants have that quality i remember when blaine gretman got our first and only Rhodes scholarship there was a large contingent of people who drove through the storm to get to the airport to meet him when he came back from his interviews, having won the Rhodes Scholarship. And I don't think that's the kind of thing that occurs at a lot of universities. And of course, it was such a relief to have that um, uh, award in such a public way. And I think the headline in the Chronicle was uh, um, 
that Harvard had not received a Rhodes Scholarship that year, <laughs> but that OSU had. And kind of like, what's going on here? <laughs> you know. So Phi Beta Kappa was the same way, and uh, we had to uh, really get organized and have different people playing different roles, such as Bruce Crowder did a lot of work on the on the data, and uh, Perry was, was an organizer, and then. Uh, uh, when we eventually got to the point where it appeared we had a good shot, then Burns made sure that the president's office um, was identified as the organizing agent for this. And uh, at the last minute, we had uh, some real difficult scheduling difficulties, and the president's office moved in. And the people who came to evaluate us uh, seemed to have a good time, and we knew that we were in good shape. Do you recall the, the visit? Well, what I recall is the, is the trip to uh, Florida. Um, now, the visit was, was exciting, but it was so busy, it kind of all um, uh, seems a blur. Uh, one thing I do remember is that we were so excited to bring these people to campus and that the Student Union Hotel was under repair at the time, and um, the air conditioning was was out and we had one of these sudden heat spells with that in the spring I believe I it was. so yeah had an early uh, heat wave and um, for people who come to Oklahoma for the first time you know this can be a difficult uh, thing to deal with but the head of the student union Mitch Kilcrease went out and bought window <laughs> units from Walmart for every hotel room in which one of the Phi Beta Kappa evaluators was going to be staying and uh, <laughs> saved the day. <laughs> that was a memorable moment. <laughs> uh, but um, it was it was really fun to observe our colleagues' enthusiasm as they met all these individuals from around the country who came to look at our programs. And you said you weren't involved when the, with the first rounds that didn't succeed, no. just in the in the later ones. No. What was your primary primary role? Um, I think I was uh, a a guide, taking people from place to place, and then Bob Spurrier and I had a session where we mm -hmm. talked about our programs and um, how that showed that OSU was determined to set up programming that would. Uh, give students the chance to achieve at a higher level. And Bob was such a great, uh, well-known um, national figure in honors that uh, they, they very much uh, trusted uh, his, his opinion on that. I will also say that for the final go-round that we were very fortunate to have at the time a well-known provost on campus, Bob Sternberg, who was not only well known internationally because of his publishing record um, in some esoteric fields, but um, he was very well known in, in Phi Beta Kappa circles. And um, I think the first time I really felt confident that we were going to get it was when we went to Florida to uh, uh, observe the vote, the final vote. And uh, there were about, I believe, Four of us, plus Burns and uh, Bob Sternberg, and when we got to the hotel, everyone just swarmed to Bob Sternberg, um, and uh, his reputation uh, in Phi Beta Kappa and as a scholar made me think that this is kind of our secret weapon this time, that uh, we haven't ever had this before, and uh, so uh, he deserves, I think he deserves some credit. For that, he wasn't with us long, but during that time, getting a Phi Beta Kappa chapter, I think, uh, was given a great assist by him. Mm. So, he and Burns made a terrific team for this last effort. Do you remember any of the questions the committee asked you when you had your meeting? Um, they were not the the first time that I went through it. There were some um, questions about uh, athletics and. Uh, uh, foreign languages uh, and uh, general studies, uh, the sorts of things that Phi Beta Kappa uh, stands for. 
Um, and you could tell at that time, this was before this previous time, four years ago, um, that they were still in a kind of a negative frame of mind regarding OSU. There had been some things that happened over the years at OSU that really made the public spotlight that weren't very, uh, very attractive. Uh, appearances of athletics before Senate committees, not being able to read, um, one of the most uh, uh, difficult times, I think, for OSU's national reputation. But this time, a lot of that stuff um, did not come up anymore. And I think it's because, again, that uh, with the kind of programs and the kind of leadership that we had, that they recognized that it was OSU's time to, be rec to, uh, to receive a charter. And uh, also, uh, the, the uh, pattern over the last 10 to 15 years had been that uh, land grants were coming into the fold on a regular basis. Uh, uh, Texas Tech had received one, I believe, just a few years before we did. They're not a land grant, but um, a school very similar to OSU. Texas A&M, Clemson uh, received one, and uh, Iowa State had had one for some time, I believe. So, uh, yeah, the, the last time seemed more routine, more, more of a formality, uh, thanks to our data uh, that was so convincing that and all the other things that had occurred with honors and the scholars, uh, it, it was going to happen. Every application got a little bit better, yeah. a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, try, how, try, how did you all again. celebrate when you got the, <laughs> got the good word? Oh, well, we went and got on the plane and came back to Stillwater. <laughs> That's about it. Um, there was a bit of cheering when we got on the plane, as I recall. Mm -hmm. A lot of people. Uh, reflecting, I think, on something very significant that had happened for OSU. A private plane or a commercial plane? <laughs> it was a private plane. Mm -hmm. So you could cheer as loud as you wanted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if, it had, if they hadn't said yes this time, do you think they would have gone a, a, another round? Well, I'm sure we would have tried eventually, uh, but you have to wait, what, two, ter two times or one time? You have to skip one. You can skip at least one. Yeah, you have to skip one application period, and you can only apply every three years. So we made it. We'd, we'd be working on another one right now, mm -hmm. uh, probably. Be my guess. Did they make you an honorary member? They did. Did they? They did. It's, it's kind of hard for me to talk about that. Oh. <laughs> Try. <laughs> well, I mean, as I indicated earlier, uh, I was a pretty ordinary student at OSU. Uh, I had a mentor who called me a late bloomer. At least you I, bloomed. <laughs> I, I was I'm kind of proud of that, actually, and uh, he put a lot of faith in me. And before long, I was uh, doing things that I should have done long before, and taking care of business in ways that uh, that I always, I think, had the talent to do. But the notion that I would ever become a Phi Beta Cap and was beyond comprehension. So it was a very emotional thing. I'm sure your family is very proud. Mm -hmm. So if you were struggling as a freshman and sophomore with your grades, I take it? Well, I just, I was just doing a lot of things. Lot of it was the 60s. I was just curious <laughs> about how your father was reacting to grades you might have seen. Well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, it was, uh, I was I was not a you know I don't I'm <laughs> I'm not comfortable with this. That's okay. Yeah. In the sixties was well Vietnam wasn't quite. Yeah. There was a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. Nope. <laughs> I'll I'll just say that that uh, I've had some amazing and fortunate highlights in my life and I put Phi Beta Cap at the top. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's because, not only for me, but because OSU's been so good to me. And I always desperately want OSU to be seen in the best light. So uh, whether it was, you know, seeing students win awards or seeing uh, colleagues succeed, uh, you know, 
just having OSU with what it deserved for so long was very gratifying too, mm -hmm. not just personally. So you would have graduated when from OSU? 69. 69. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your yeah, graduation right. day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was in Lewis Field. Very hot day. Yeah. Outside. Huh? Outside. Yeah. And who all came? Oh uh, well, my family was here, <laughs> and uh, I can't even remember who spoke. It was uh, a year later that Richard Nixon gave the uh, his last his last public appearance was at OSU commencement, mm -hmm. where he gave a, a speech right before he re uh, resigned from office. Mm -hmm. So those were interesting times, to yes. say the least. Well, how often would you go back to Fairview when you were a student here? Mm -hmm. Back then, not as many people went home as much as they do now. And uh, the reasons for that were many. People didn't have cars, for one thing, but uh, it was fun here. There were all sorts of activities going on, and everybody stayed on campus, unlike now when everybody bails out on the weekends. So, so yeah. I'll and you mentioned you were year. a basketball fan? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Henry Iba was, he's, he's in the uh, same... Uh, category is Henry Bellman in most OSU people's minds. So you got <laughs> to see him coach? Mm -hmm, I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then was Eddie Sutton any a team? Eddie was on a team that I saw play. Yeah. Yeah. I was 10 years old. Beat the University of Kansas and Wilt Chamberlain. You remember that I night? Remember. Huh? I don't remember where I was sitting. Were you at OSU when Iba was the coach of the Olympic team? No, that was shortly after I left. Okay. You're talking about the famous, uh, that was in 72, and I was gone by then, but um, that was the Munich Olympics where they had the supposedly rigged ending, and uh, he, well, we really suffered for him <laughs> mm -hmm. having gone through that. He's such a, such a gentleman. And you said you remembered where you, where you were sitting? I do, I do, yeah. I can still remember. That game was a, a really famous game. That was before the shot clock. And they would let the uh, clock run down. Uh, OSU would hold the ball for two or three minutes to take the last shot. <laughs> the stall, the stall game, they called it. And your parents had season tickets, or no, you just happened didn't to didn't need season tickets then. You just come early and go to the freshman game, and then you stayed where you were for the for the uh, real game, <laughs> real game, the varsity game. But they still traveled from Fairview to here mm -hmm. to, to the yeah. games? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And what was your major? I was in political science, and then I got a master's in English. Okay. And then a, a PhD in English from uh, <clears throat> University of Tulsa, um, focusing on um, the British war poets of World War I. World War I. Uh, Were you planning to teach then? Yeah, and I did teach. I, t I taught here in the Honors College for most of my career. It's mm -hmm. terrific. It's a general studies uh, overview. And uh, I did that uh, because I thought it would help me in my administrative career. I, I didn't teach for a while. I thought I was a fundraiser. And I realized that I was losing touch with the students mm -hmm. by not being in the classroom. So I scurried back and never, never uh, regretted that decision. I was not paid for teaching at OSU. It was all voluntary. Mm -hmm. And uh, then um, when I was in my early 50s, I got a little burned out on teaching and started considering just doing administration again. And OSU sent me to Cambridge. And uh, after a summer in Cambridge with OSU students, I realized that I had really not become as good a teacher as I could become, hanging around with those British scholars and watching our students succeed. So I completely revamped my teaching approach and came back and taught for 15 more years uh, following that opportunity. So you, you can well imagine why I say OSU did amazing things for me. Mm -hmm. Cambridge, the research program, great colleagues. And, uh, it's been a, a, a great career. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got a closet full of orange? Not really. Not really? No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, how do you show your OSU 
pride when you're out and about, out of the state, say? Um, I always try to wear a hat or a backpack with OSU. Okay. And it always gets a comment. Somebody always says, hey, I know about that school. So mm -hmm. I like that. <clears throat> and um, uh, right now I'm on the Stillwater School Board, and uh, I'm uh, always trying to work on collaborative programs, such as one that's going on next week at the Downtown Museum that involves Stillwater Middle School students and a Native American artist who's coming to town mm -hmm. to talk about creation myths through art. And um, so I try to I try to work for the community and the university in that capacity too. And the school board has been a terrific experience after having been involved in college life for 30 years, 35 years. So you have children? Mm -hmm. I have a 40-year-old son and a 37-year-old daughter. He is a Hollywood film editor. And uh, he actually worked with your people uh, a couple of weeks ago on a virtual reality thing that they're doing on Western Oklahoma. And my daughter is a uh, makeup artist and uh, uh, performance artist in New York City. Did they attend OSU? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our son went to NYU and our daughter went to KU, University of Kansas. Okay. During their, their era, not every OS, they still order student stayed at OSU. They, Especially, uh, it seems, children of faculty, they were more inclined to go out and mm -hmm. get away. <laughs> well, I wish she doesn't offer necessarily what some want, yeah. so mm -hmm. that's okay, too. You mentioned before the interview that you were working on a grant for Phi Beta Kappa. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, as I just indicated, the um, uh, museum which is another of Burns Hargis's, I think, great successes uh, added to the list. Um, when I retired, I still had a little bit of, of energy left and decided that I would try to set up an arrangement between the middle school and the uh, <coughs> museum. And uh, we had that year uh, several visits by the art department of the uh, middle school to the museum where they received instruction in writing about art, which was very gratifying. And then we used that uh, concept to write a grant that we submitted to Phi Beta Kappa to support this Native American artist who is coming. So um, we were happy to receive that. It's, it's not a huge grant, but it's sizable enough to help. And um, so next week, the uh, art department and some Native American groups in the Stillwater Public Schools will go work with this uh, artist who's here. And uh, I think uh, there were five schools who were given. It was from our region. Uh, they made these monies available and we were one of five schools that were awarded. And any other role within Phi Beta Kappa? Do you have? Supportive. Um, I'm on a couple of committees. I'm trying to help Perry out whenever I can. Uh, Charles has got this area covered from what I can tell. I try to recruit students. I know a lot of students still. They're dwindling fast as the years go by. But uh, we try to uh, contact students to let them know what a great opportunity Phi Beta Kappa is. Um, this is not just an OSU thing, but it's a national thing that um, Phi Beta Kappa uh, is in the ears of many undergraduates, yet another society that wants money to, for you to join, and they don't understand that it is a game changer for their resumes. Uh, because I found out in my previous job at OSU that there are a lot of organizations that don't necessarily do much for the students' benefit. And so it's, it's not unusual that students get suspicious of every little uh, organization that asks for $100 to join their club. Mm -hmm. So they have to understand uh, what the value of Phi Beta Kappa is, and that's a continuing effort for several of us on campus. And it's so new. Too. Was it 2011, 20? 
13. four years ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. Four years. <clears throat> I mentioned several times that my mother was so proud that uh, she's buried with my fight beating captain. I know you mentioned yeah. that. Yeah, that's one of the highlights of my, you know, my, you know, my, say my life. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. I, uh, I have several friends now around the country who are in, and they all have a similar, similar story to tell about that undergraduate designation and what it means. <clears throat> well, when you were first started at OSU, you said you were going around the state recruiting <laughs> students. Yeah. Where were some of the places that stand out in your mind from the little bitty well, towns? Or Well, I always made it a point to visit Corn and Colony, Oklahoma, K-O-R-N, K-O-L-O-N-Y. Um, okay. They were out in the middle of a wheat field, uh, and uh, a lot of OSU supporters on their, these little faculty, so I love going to these country schools. Um, and um, I think that um, the most uh, entertaining story that I have is that uh, these were heated competitions for these students and uh, there were some individuals out in the panhandle who were twin brothers and uh, both semi-finalists and I was new to the job and I thought, I'm gonna make it a point to, to see that they come to OSU and uh, so I um, <coughs> I drove out there um, twice. Uh, once I had to make detours, I mean, the Panhandle's a long way, and uh, thought that I was making progress, and I asked them if there was anything that they'd like to do if I could get them to come to OSU for a recruiting visit, and they said they'd like to see Barry Sanders play football. <laughs> so um, I found a game and, and brought them here, and I, I naively said, that probably did it. <laughs> That, that probably uh, um, cinched the deal. And they were really outstanding. Uh, and I became, I thought, close enough to them that I could uh, evaluate their intent on this. Um, so I was dismayed when I called later uh, to find out that they had not decided to come to OSU. And uh, I said, "Wow, I, you know, <laughs> what, what, what went on here? Why are, why are you not coming to OSU?" And it turned out that um, a comp a competitor uh, was aware of their religious affiliation, and he sent a person to visit them, who <laughs> who was connected to their church, <laughs> where they prayed about this decision. <laughs> and I always got a big charge out of that. I mean, just when you think you've covered all the possible angles, uh, some, there's a surprise out there. So, um, you know, these were really, really um, competitive years uh, with a lot, of, a lot of people banking on the fact that OSU could solve its any reputation problems that it had with National Merit students. Well, National Merit is based on the results of, of a single test, uh, the, the PSAT, and um, it really does reveal a certain kind of, of student who is successful in a certain kind of way, but again, it did not seem to fit the, the land-grant model that well of um, someone who was maybe a leader, someone who had so-so but not great uh, scores, and um, we found that the, that was the bread and butter for OSU, and that we could best locate those students through a valedictorian program. You would get students who had mid to upper range ACTs, but maybe not completely off the charts. Um, and um, those students would come to OSU and really prove themselves, not only as students, but as leaders. And that is what led to so many Truman scholarships. Mm -hmm. We had 16 or 17 uh, over from the time that Lewis Blair <laughs> visited us for the next 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. Because that kind of person is someone who 
wants to su succeed academically, but also help others through public service. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, the, yeah, those were interesting years on the road. I, I don't think I could have done it for too many more years. Well, it's, and that was before years. computers. You had to <coughs> yeah. find these students. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Since we have you here, what led to the, to the decisions to start focusing on research scholarships? Like the Nyblock, the Wentz, you know, so on. Because that really <coughs> fulfills a need. Interesting story. Um, the, has, has anybody done an interview on the Lou Wentz story? No. Wow, that's a big one. Um, I could probably save that for another time and get Trish Houston in here on that. Bloody. Um, and um, because I think the Wentz is as much uh, responsible for the um, Phi Beta Kappa as anything else. Um, you know, he was the Oklahoma oil man, lived in Ponca City, and he endowed um, several programs at several universities in the state. And um, originally, the terms were that they were supposed to be primarily loans, that's what he wanted his money to be spent for. Um, and um, before long they were able to figure out a way to alter that slice slightly so that it could be work steady. Um, and that's kind of what it was when I arrived at OSU. There were a lot of students who were Wentz scholars who were filing in offices, doing typing, and that sort of thing. And they were well known, very successful, but they were appointed and they were basically doing clerical work. Well, the Wentz Foundation decided, and, and, and rightfully so, that probably Lou Wentz would have preferred a different sort of program. And strangely enough, the meeting that took place to discuss whether OSU would retain its Lou Wentz funds occurred during the first month that President Halligan was here and that I was in my job and so someone got us two together to talk about this with some other staff and we decided that we were going to propose to the Wentz Foundation which at that time consisted of the president of the university that would be Jim Halligan um, a couple of former friends of Lou Wentz and a child who, uh, whose father was a friend of Lou Wentz and Trish Houston who's an, a, a Stillwater investor. She is the money manager of the Lou Wentz program in Stillwater. Very remarkable woman. She has been uh, named um, as one of the top 50 female investors in the country she has a highly successful accounting and investing firm with a branch in Woodward, Oklahoma, and um, a real go-getter and proponent of OSU and Stillwater. So at that meeting, um, this is almost as, as memorable as the Henry Bellman meeting, um, we were informed in no uncertain terms that they wanted to see something a little more academic. Uh, through the use of Wentz, Wentz funds. And um, <clears throat> after an hour or so of conversation and some very firm instructions, uh, the president turned to a couple of us who represented the provost's office, because that's where I reported, and he said, you all need to fix this. <laughs> because we knew that we probably wouldn't have the funds for too much longer. And it was important because they had just begun, it, ha, it was a very conservative foundation for many years and they didn't invest their money, but um, a recent president had decided that they needed to invest Wentz funds and it just skyrocketed. It went from something like a $2 million corpus to $12 million in just a few years. So it was, it became big and we were able to take between six and eight hundred thousand dollars every year uh, because of the interest rates at the time and apply it in, in whatever ways we wanted as long as we satisfied the foundation. 
So the first program that we started was the research program, and guess who was in the first program? Blaine Gretemann, OSU's first Rhodes Scholar. He wrote a paper on John Steinbeck and the Oklahoma public response to the book uh, Grapes of Wrath, and it was received uh, with great enthusiasm. He had an offer to publish it. The next year he applied for a Rhodes Scholarship and he got that and everybody started saying, well that, that WITS program really <laughs> really helps people, doesn't it? And um, so every year since then we have had between 35 and 45, sometimes as many, 50 kids studying under OSU faculty such as Charles for a significant amount of money with no strings attached except that they finish in one year and that it be a legitimate academic topic. And it doesn't have to be in their major. I think that was a really beautiful decision that we made because that gives students the idea that you can be scholarly and have other interests besides your profession. So we've had a lot of students who said, I just want to do this, and we find them a mentor, and that's the way it goes. Um, so in addition to the research, we had a leadership component to the Wentz. Uh, we actually, for a few years, had a humanities program um, scholarship under the Wentz. And I don't think it's, Charles, you can tell me if this is hyperbole or not, but I don't know if there's any program that altered the landscape as much for scholarship as the Wentz for undergraduates, uh, other than the with, Honors College. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. My yeah. son became an engineering major because of the Wentz. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I know uh, my own students benefit from it. Yeah. And often they go into graduate school and, you know, they continue. Yeah. Well, when you say they have to finish in a year, what is it they're finishing? An, an article or just a... Could be they don't a get graded maybe? on this. They are expected to come up with a thesis and explore it. And if their thesis doesn't work out, but that they've shown they've for a year that they've tried to prove the thesis, then they get credit for it. We never gave them a grade. It was all between them and their mentors. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a, a really exciting uh, connection to watch take shape on a regular basis. There were some, you know, there were some times when we wondered, but but uh, we didn't want the students to feel anything except excitement to live the life of a scholar for a year, without any sort of of grading or anything like that. They did have to show a finished product and talk about it, but they weren't graded like they would be a normal a normal class. Talk about it to who? The committee or to just their... We have a, we would and still have, uh, the Scholar Development Office still has a spring uh, display where the students exhibit their work and talk about what they've done. And sometimes within a department, the student will have to uh, mm -hmm. talk about it in front of faculty and fellow students. And that's 40 or 50 students per year? Mm -hmm. oh. I can see how that would be a game changer. It was. Mm -hmm. Oh, then you see the excitement in their eyes when they when they get one. Yeah. It's competitive. Yeah, it is highly competitive, um, but we were usually able to award at least half of the number of applications, if not more. Um, and one thing that was key, and and I I was really proud of this decision, but when the students. Uh, wanted to uh, uh, have a mentor and then eventually if they were chosen as a national and international scholar we said only OSU faculty sorry no advisors no presidents no deans only an OSU faculty member who direct can direct this and be you know I don't know if you've been to the area of the student union where a lot of these students are depicted but those are all faculty members and early in the program we had a, some students who said well I want my advisor to be it or I want this dean to be the person whom I recognize and we'd say you know we're just going to stick with faculty members for this because those are the ones that actually make these programs happen and it's not just because you have a friendship with some administrator. I couldn't go on the wall as a student mentor, for instance, because I wasn't a full OSU faculty member. So, um, um, 
yeah, that was good. And then the Cambridge program uh, <clears throat> was um, exciting and helpful, but I, I really think that the one that, that was a game changer was the Lentz. Mm -hmm. And you should talk to Trish Houston before this is all over. Yeah. How did the Wentz Foundation group around that table? How do they feel about all of this success? Great. Great. Yeah, in fact, um, as a result of the first few years of success, then some of us from OSU got to go watch their deliberations as a board and how they allocated their money. Mm -hmm. And uh, they always really enjoyed hearing about, we take students sometimes, and hearing about the students who are actually performing at a high level who then became maybe a Truman Scholar or something like that. So you got check marks with them. Did, did uh, Henry Bellman ever come back around and say, good job? He did. We became fast friends. Yeah. We spent a lot of time together. Uh, my secretary and I started a book drive of agriculture and public policy textbooks that OSU faculty had. And there was a Henry Bellman Museum in um, Billings. And uh, we... Uh, uh, made it a point to take those books up and uh, as a, a gift from OSU faculty uh, for his museum. And I spent quite a few wonderful days on his ranch up there just talking about his career and life at OSU. And uh, it was a remarkable time. I wish I had those conversations taped. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few tapes out there of him, but not many. Yeah. So you've Henry Alba, Henry Bellman, any other Henrys? Well, I didn't know Henry Bennett, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> That's a good name for OSU. Yeah, it is. Henry. Mm -hmm. Significant people. Yeah. Just uh, one last question. As you were a student here, it must be very gratifying you know, for me as a faculty member to see how the school has evolved over the years. Mm -hmm. Did you expect this when you were a student here? No, I didn't even expect it when we returned in 81 as a student. I, you know, uh, I mean, OSU was a, a great and fun place with a lot of fascinating people. Um, but I didn't realize how much room there was for positive growth at that time. Uh, it never really occurred to me. And uh, what has happened uh, with the campus, both in terms of uh, the way it looks, but also in, in its... Uh, reputation and and its focus on things that it does well uh, wow it's uh, really been fun to be a part of and I, and I find that it really uh, to be common at at the land grants those kinds of those kinds of feelings are pretty typical I was sent by the way to train for this job to Kansas State which had an uncommon number of Truman and Rhodes scholarships at the time. And uh, they had a legendary advisor there named uh, Nancy Twiss. Uh, all of a sudden this comes rushing back. And she showed me around campus and this was after I met Lewis Blair. Then I got uh, instruction at Kansas State on how they designed their program. And uh, just a few days ago, uh, Kansas State and OSU collaborated on trying to help a student win a, a Marshall Scholarship. And I don't think that would happen in many places, but the land-grant mentality, and I know that Charles feels this because he couldn't be as successful as he's been if he didn't have that attitude about students and, and, uh, and our school, um, is something that goes beyond what I see nationally. I was the president of the uh, national organization of uh, people who do what I do. We started one about 25 years ago. And um, the, the land grants always kind of got off in a corner and compared stories. And uh, I think it's because we deal with so many first generation kids who come out of rural environments and all you have to do is get that light to click on once and then sit back and enjoy the ride and I'm not so sure that that takes place in a lot of universities where, you know, it's just another member of a family going to get the obligatory degree. Uh, so um, I've always been really 
excited to be at a land grant. My job did not require me to go to faculty meetings in my field of English, but it gave me the opportunity to hang out with agriculture teachers, engineers, and the, there were so many differences among those people, but they all seemed really to be invested in making this a wonderful place for students to study and sharing in the community life. If, if, if I can make one generalization about OSU as it applies nationally, I think that would be it. And the feeling of public service mm -hmm. that I don't think you'll get at many other uh, universities. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it sounds like a, a change in point for OSU was ha hiring you to begin with so that you could be in that yeah. office when Henry Bellman came in and said, why aren't you I doing was, this? I, I will say that I was at the right place at the right time, but there were about 20 to 30 other people such as Charles and, I mean, I haven't even talked about my secretary yet who for 25 years devoted herself to our students in a way that only a faculty member could recognize because she was just as much a mentor as I was. Edward Jones, who is an internationally known Milton scholar, very esoteric field, was the first person who pulled me aside and said, I was glad to see you get that job because OSU can win these awards. And I said, how? How do we do it? And he said, well, I know two people right now who are highly qualified to be Rhodes candidates. And for 15 years, he and I uh, did strategy on a Sunday morning run around the lake about students and faculty members who could help. Um, as Charles indicates, at OSU it's the team. And there was a group of people who knew what they had in their classrooms and they would send them my way and then we would tie the whole thing together. So yeah, with Bob Spurrier and all the people that I've mentioned here today, um, it was almost inevitable that we turned that corner from earlier times, and uh, I think it can get even better. Really do. do you want to name your secretary? Yeah, name secretary. Give her a Gail Gillen. Yeah. Gail Gillen. Yeah. Last time I interviewed, I forgot. I immediately set up a follow-up appointment. <laughs> she was so instrumental. Yeah. Um, and is she still here? Or she she retired? is. She's retired happily in Stillwater. Still very healthy. She was, uh, she was every bit as excited every time a student did something <laughs> well as any faculty member, and we had a lot of, we had a lot of students who came by to get her counsel. One, one of our students, a Truman Scholar, actually practiced his proposal to his wife, to Gail. <laughs> he chose, he chose her to, uh, to go through, go through it before he used it for real. So, <laughs> so yeah. She probably wouldn't come, I would think. This sort of thing would make her uncomfortable. She didn't like being in the spotlight, but you might give her a call. Yeah, come Yeah. She gave, she gave OSU every ounce of her being for 25 years. And uh, I think that they're, you know, that group is every bit as significant at OSU for keeping this place running as those of us who get to go out and, and do the the teaching and the recruiting and all that. I mean, across campus I always encountered a lot of uh, staff people, men and women, who didn't get a lot of recognition but would work it overtime and, and, and really uh, put their careers on the line to and help OSU succeed. And get air conditioners for the Yeah, <laughs> That's right, Mish Kofries, that's true. <laughs> Anything else you want to know, Charles? Just to say it was a pleasure, and I always valued what you, what you did, or still do. And I'm sure without, uh, without your successes, we probably would not have Phi Beta Gap here. I think that's... that's you sure you wouldn't say that, Charles? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> sure. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Well... So I, I know how your office I, may differ from myself. I mean, when I, what gets me <clears> is <throat> when I think of the unusual way that I became connected to OSU, as an infant. I mean, I have a picture of being held by the Dean of Arts and Sciences in 1947, who's my dad's mentor, Schiller Scroggs. 
with an OSU 19 question mark question mark on it. And then, you know, the, the people that I met, I, I met Burns as an undergraduate. Wow. Meeting Henry Bellman, Lewis Blair, who was the most influential man in scholarship competitions in the world at the time, who fell in love with OSU and helped us in many, many ways. Um, so, uh, I'm just glad that it happened for OSU's sake. I mean, uh, Bob Spurrier. I, I'm afraid I'm going to start leaving people out now. But, uh, there was a question, if we didn't get it this time, whether we would do it again. Really? Yeah, because people were just so burned out. Mm -hmm. And this is such a good effort. Yeah. If it w with all the pl things we had in place, if it wasn't going to work this time, what would work? Yeah. Right, yeah. what would work? Well, I appreciate your saying that. And, uh, you know, uh, the uh, humble atmosphere of OSU has always been both a benefit and a kind of a curse, in a way. A benefit in that our students surprised interview committees when they went out because they weren't the, the polished Ivy League type, but they had a different approach and they were, they were uh, first generation and, and, and they had a different style than a lot of these committees had, uh, had experienced before. So someone like Blaine Gretemann or Joel Halcom Chris Stevens and all these people. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, uh, what is Blaine doing now? He's a faculty member. He's got a great job at the University of Iowa. He is uh, on on the English department staff as the Shakespe resident Shakespearean, mm -hmm. and he is also got a joint has a joint appointment at the uh, Iowa Writers Conference, which is considered the preeminent creative writing program in the world. He stays in touch. Yeah. yeah. In fact, Edward Jones, whom I just mentioned, is with him this week uh, at Iowa. Um, so, so my point is that um, that part of it uh, led to some success. But the uh, the flip side of that is that OSU's aw shucks, it wasn't anything <laughs> mentality has kept us from promoting ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I served on the University Marketing Committee, marketing for many years, just because I wanted to help make the case for the kinds of successes our students were having. Um, but compared to a lot of universities, and I think you see uh, a lot of behavior in times of crisis from OSU that reflects that, that kind of frontier spirit of, okay, this is a, this is, a bad thing, but we're going to dig in our heels and do our best and see if we can overcome. And you can look, see what's happened at OSU in many ways, in many occasions over the years, where that that sort of, uh, of land grant mentality has enabled us to get through tight spots. Well, and, and has built loyalty. People mm -hmm. are really loyal to OSU yeah. for various reasons. Mm -hmm. but. I've gone on and on. No, so. it's fine. Anything yeah. that we've not asked that we should cover? I'm sure I'll think of a million things when I leave here, but not right now. <laughs> well, if Henry Bellman was sitting here, what would you do? what would you two be discussing? <clears throat> well, he would probably talk be talking about um, his wheat crop. Uh, in fact, um, I went to school with a a man who is one of um, he he and I were on a high school basketball team and he <clears throat> his name is John Gosney and he and his wife are renowned organic farmers in the state um, which is a very hard job in western Oklahoma to grow crops without any sort of fertilizer or he would call it medication but he has been enormously successful and um, uh, he and his wife uh, travel around the state selling their products and their organic uh, food processors in the state use their wheat and their their steers and their beef and um, so <clears throat> when I was visiting him about three years ago right at the time that that I had just written something about Mr. Bellman 
Um, John told me that uh, he got a, a call from a lady, this was when Mr. Bellman was still alive, who said that her father was a very successful Oklahoma farmer and he w had heard that John in western Oklahoma was growing crops without any fertilizer. And he wanted to talk to him about it because he thought that it was uh, almost impossible to do. So John said, I'll be happy to talk to him. Well, you can see what's coming here. Uh, the day of the, of, the, of the appointment came along and Henry Bellman gets out of the car. His, his daughter had driven him over. And of course that created a great, great flurry of activity with my friend. And um, he uh, came in and sat for two hours and they talked about their wheat and uh, what, what John's secret was and that he might try some of, some of these things. Um, but anyway, it was just the essence of Henry Bellman. Um, he didn't try to get an appointment because he was Henry Bellman. He just had a business proposition and he wanted to see if, if John could help. Um, so anyway, two years later, then my friend, um, John, was named uh, the environmentally successful farmer of the year in the state of Oklahoma and was brought to the capital and given all sorts of recognition and so on and so forth. And so this was a close friend in college and we had a, um, from high school and we had a great time saying, how would we have ever been so fortunate who could have ever predicted that both of our careers would lead us to Henry Bellman? That's a pretty amazing story. Is it possible to show us the photograph? Uh, yeah, I think so. Was he aware that you changed the name of your program to the Henry yes, Bellman? Yes, he was. was. He? And he was very proud of that. I wondered. Right on top. I told you why I carry this. You can understand now why I carry this. Sure. There's Mr. Bellman. And, and where are you? That's me. Which one? This one right here. Yes. Fifth, fifth one. Years old. Then, this is the friend I just told you about, the day we graduated from high school. So I carry those two pictures, because uh, both of those guys mean it. It meant a lot. You never know where life is going to take you, dude. Huh? You never know where life is going to take never. you. Never. Never. A lot of good breaks <laughs> along the way. And a good journey. Yeah. All right. Well, we thank you for okay. sharing it with us today. Yeah.